Hello everybody. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. I hope you have a good lunchtime or a good night, depending on where you are all over the world. We had more than 175 registrations for today's um, talk and we are very happy that the topic seems to be very interesting for all of you. So uh, my name is Martin Nietzsche. I'm your host, well not your host, I would say your moderator tonight. Um, to my left uh, or right, depending on your view, you, you have Norbert Gerke, he is our um, presenter or, mm, tonight, and you have Sergey. And Sergey is from UPU, and I would like to give over for him to a short welcome from UPU to our tonight's session, or to today's session, depending on where you are. Well, it's always hard in these international courts to get the right time for everybody. So, Sergey, up to you. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, well, good evening, as Martin said, to everybody. And I'm really happy to welcome all of you to this first webinar in our series. Uh, this is actually a joint initiative of the um, uh, newly created Postal Payment Services User Group, and, well, that consists of two former groups, Post Transfer and TPS Clearing, and the International Bureau itself. Uh, we do plan to have at least three of the of the webinars in the coming months, and uh, the rest will depend really on your interest interest and involvement. Because then, if you are happy and there is a strong demand for more, we can proceed. Uh, as for well, introductory remarks, let me say a few words of of the post transfer itself and and the posts in the uh, which are active in the postal payment services market. And, well, post all over the world, they are really recognized as trusted public service providers. They have a global network and they have best partners in um, the delivery of accessible and affordable financial services. And when we are talking about financial services, that's, of course, social payments and remittances. And what those do is really, really crucial for the end bank populations, especially. UPU itself is constantly assisting member countries in this area of financial services development and that results in building a worldwide electronic postal payments network and this network is based on the legal framework in the form of the UPU International Treaty, well it's called the Postal Payment Services Agreement and its regulations and of course, well, furthermore, the um, uh, electronic postal payments network and the trademark, well, the recognized brand post transfer are really useful tools that allow postal operators to provide uh, modern money transfer service. The adoption of this brand of the post transfer uh, can facilitate the commercial positioning of the uh, transfers in the global remittances market under one single trusted brand. It can also help to reinforce business as well as the role of the post itself in fostering financial inclusion. That will really bring a so much needed market visibility to the International Postal Payment Service and will help customers um, to make them aware of the state of the art technology and high quality standards that really underpin uh, provision of such service. The objective of this uh, webinar, and I hope that Norbert will talk much more than I, uh, is really to provide you guys with uh, some thoughts on present and future trends and developments, and with that to incentive further improvement of payment services. I hope that we will all get some insights on what types of payments are emerging now on the market, and of course what are customers' needs nowadays. Uh, from our side at the UPU, we'll see how post-transfer service can and already uh, respond to those needs. So with that, Martin, I hand it over back to you and uh, then to Norbert. Thanks, Sergey, for that introduction and especially thanks to you and your group to make this talk possible because you're the one who is uh, giving this all to all of us. So thanks to you and thanks a lot. So we will switch over to Norbert now. And uh, first of all, let me, before we start to the presentation, give you one or two advice. Uh, some of you asked whether there will be a Spanish or French, French or other translation. No, sorry about that. This one is just English, but I'm quite sure that all of you should be able to follow the presentation. 
The second one, I'm seeing already a lot of uh, greetings from all over the world. So let's let me start with Bhutan and Suriname and Brussels and Chile and South Sudan, South Africa, Bermuda, Turkey, Argentina, Peru, Nigeria, Montenegro, and so on. I probably Aruba is there as well. I would like to be on Aruba now. Here's it's snowing here, so Aruba might be nice. So thanks a lot for all that greetings, and it's great that some of you already found the chat. Whenever you have a question, please put it in the chat and we will be able to answer these questions uh, maybe sometimes while the presentation goes on. So we have several questions section there or after the presentation. So if you have any questions on what Norbert is telling you, um, we will be able to answer all of these questions afterwards. So that is Norbert now. So Norbert Gerke is our, he's the founder and representative director of Tokyo FinTech. He is an investor and advisor for several fintech companies in Japan and all over the world with a focus on strategy and operations as well, um, of course, of the Asia market entry. Um, I know Norbert now for about, let me think, about 30 years, and he spent most of his career in capital markets. Uh, he was managing director in Goldman Sachs Technology Division. He was at Barclays Investment Bank, and for some time he was a consultant also. So, I think if we need somebody who can give us some, some overview on what is going on in payment markets, there are probably not a lot of people who can do this in a way Norbert can do that. And beside of that, um, and that's something which I personally find very interesting for an international audience like this, he lived, uh, well, he was born in Europe. He lived in Europe, in UK and Germany for some time, but he lived as well in the US, in New York. He lived in Japan for a lot of time. Um, to say something private, uh, he has his family in, Ch in Japan as well. So he is a very international person. And I think for an international audience like this, this combination from a worldwide view and a lot of experience in the payment marketing is something we cannot get better than with Norbert. So said, saying that, I will give over to Norbert now. And Norbert, the presentation is up to you. The stage is yours. We are now up to 100 uh, attendees. and. Well, the microphone is yours, and let's have a lot of fun, all of us. Wonderful. Thank you for the introduction, Martin and Sergey. Uh, thank you all for taking the time. It's a pleasure to be here, and I do love talking about these topics. So um, I, I saw the comments. Uh, unfortunately, both my French and my Spanish are very bad. I could do the presentation in Japanese or German, and uh, because I do that. Most of the slides I'm using actually won't have text on them, so you'll see lots of pictures. Hopefully, you have some enjoyment listening to me, and it's going to be a wild ride. So, I, as Martin said, I wear many different hats for the purposes of this presentation. I'm the founder of Tokyo FinTech, uh, which is a community of about 3,000, 3,300 people. And our purpose is to educate and bring innovation to Japan. We also have communities in Seoul and in Berlin. And naturally, over the last year, these have all become much more virtual. So if you are so inclined and you want to be part of that, you can find them on meetup.com and join them for free. We do have events regularly. Um, before I get into the meat of the presentation, the most important person in my life, and that is my lawyer, uh, will insist on me making a few comments. The first one is that I will absolutely comment in either in the presentation or in the Q&A on the situation of a public company or a soon-to-be public company or the valuation of a private company. Uh, all these comments are my own opinions, and since I work for myself, they're also my employer's opinions, but by no means they are investment advice, and you should do your own research, D-Y-O-R. Secondly, um, obviously we live in an age where information abundance is all around us, and I don't think anything I'll present today, and it's never been my job, will be particularly uh, new. Um, I've built a career based on crystallizing essential information and positioning in a way that uh, allows for management 
action and strategic um, decisions. Um, but if you spend enough time Googling and reading, and I spend probably half my day every day uh, trying to keep up with what is going on in the overall fintech space, then much of what you hear here today, you will find you won't find it in necessarily distilled in a one hour presentation. Um, thirdly and last, uh, I'll, I'll do this because I have lots of fun talking about these topics. Uh, this is my eighth of these presentations this year. I think that makes it about two per week. Um, I'm not getting compensated for this. So if you do like the presentation, you can do me a favor and mention it to somebody else. And if you don't like it, then please come back to me and with some constructive criticism because I'm always happy to learn. So we got this out of the way, fantastic. Let's get into the topic itself. If I had four hours of your time, I could talk about payments for four hours, but I might use one hour each on the following topics. And one is payments, which we covered today. A blockchain would be the second one or distributed ledger technology. That leads us to cryptocurrencies and then to central bank digital currencies. So the focus of today's discussion will be on the payments topic. I will, with some examples, touch very lightly on uh, cryptocurrencies or flavor of CDBCs, but this will by no means be the full discussion. And as I said, these will lend themselves to a whole another hour of discussion. So as we put in the title, our premise is that the marginal cost of any digital transaction will be zero. And to a large extent, it is actually already zero. And the examples that we have are all around us, especially with the background of UTU. We don't have to necessarily go through this in detail, right? Um, Email is free, we've got a subscription for the internet service. Um, and there's this cartoon where 20 years ago, you were happy you got this email, right? We all got the, if you're old enough, you know the AOL screen that says like, you've got mail. And now we're quite happy when we actually get a physical letter. So uh, this has become free. Um, phone calls, um, my girlfriend used to be in Korea and I paid about three Deutschmarks at the time per minute in phone calls. Today, voice over IP is free, voice is digitized and becomes data. And again, it's a transaction that's free. Now, the funny thing about some of these parts of the presentations I'm going to go through is that I, I use certain examples for two years probably. And um, I think the news flow has been very favorable for me recently. So we'll hit on a few topics that just made the headlines over the last few weeks, although we've been talking about them for a long time. And hopefully some of the, the crazy ideas that I'm going to throw at you um, will see coming to fruition in, in another two years time. So one of the crazy things where the price has gone to zero is also securities trading. And Robinhood, which if you followed the, the market news over the last few weeks, has been totally in the news because of uh, bubbles and short squeezes, etc. But Robinhood has changed an entire industry um, that really hasn't seen much change since the arrival of the discount brokers. And now you've got free stock trading in the US, you've got eight securities in Hong Kong that got acquired by SoFi, and we've got SBI here in Japan starting to allow free shares trading as well. So again, it's a digital transaction that uh, the price is zero. And so if you're looking at payments now, right, what is the difference between uh, sending an email and sending a payment? And 
obviously Google tried this a, a while ago that you can just attach money to your email as well or to your chat. And the answer is there isn't a difference. So um, there will simply be uh, a price of zero attached to that and we need to deal with that. So naturally the question is how do we make money then? Well, first answer is that what is somebody's business is somebody else's customer acquisition cost. And especially if you look at China, but also if you look at the neo banks in Europe, payments are free um, because they are essentially the customer acquisition cost. So I'll get you onto the platform and then I'm trying to cross sell you into an ecosystem um, especially if you look at uh, WeChat, you look at Ant Financial, right? You you have a money market fund. You can buy insurance. You can trade stocks and and all these things that ultimately generate money. But then again, the payment itself is free, and hopefully, and the question is one of: Are we in a bubble? Are we not in a bubble? As far as startups, fintech, right, financing overall is concerned. Um, the monetization question obviously is a, a challenging one. And we've seen, um, especially in Australia, I think are the recent examples, we've seen one of the new banks fold and we've seen another one being acquired by NAB. It's probably something that you're going to see more of also in, in other markets, but it's nice to get folks on your platform, right? And the, the user numbers are always communicated, which reminds me a bit of the, the, the clicks and the eyeballs of the internet bubble, but are these actually are able to monetize the flow? Um, so big question. Um, the, the second approach to monetizing is that you give people shiny new things. And in this case, it's a Revolut metal credit card, um, which is positioned and marketed as a huge innovation. And maybe if you're 20 years old and haven't been around credit cards for a long time, it is. Um, my personal opinion here, if you're interested, is it's actually not innovative at all. Uh, it uses obviously, in this case, existing MasterCard payment rails, and uh, it uses a technology uh, that is one of the two inventions of the banking industry over the last 70 years, the other being the ATM. And uh, the ATM is on its way out, and we're going to talk about that later a bit as well. The third model is that you have either subscriptions or you actually have the recipient of the payment pay for it. And Sweden is a fantastic example for that because Sweden is probably as close to a cashless society as we can all imagine, while Germany and Japan are at the bottom end of cashless adoption. Um, so I would consider myself uh, being a German living in Japan, probably an expert for cash rather than for cashless, quite honestly. Um, Swish, uh, founded by the six biggest uh, Swedish banks, or the six Swedish banks, uh, in 2012, and everybody uses it. Payments are free, I believe, for retail consumers, and the recipient of the fund pays uh, a certain fee, depending on the size, plus uh, possible an annual license fee as well. So. Obviously, subscription model, premium services, bundling, etc., works. So that's the premise of what I want to talk about. I will just continue running. I don't assume that any questions at this point, but otherwise, Martin, please interrupt me. So in the set next section, we want to discuss if payments are free, what is actually a payments company? And that's actually a very simple question with a very difficult answer. And the picture is really, really fuzzy. It's actually so fuzzy that even the German regulators don't know how to answer this and, and hence the, the Wirecard debacle. 
Um, but I want to take a few um, shots at that. So obviously, payments historically has been a banking function. Um, it's a space where we have quite a number of startups active. And when you scale that, you can actually have payments as a platform. Um, and then it's ultimately, I will talk about that if you look at it from a VC and private equity perspective, um, right, which I'm obviously with the startups I'm invested in and that I'm supporting quite heavily involved in. If, if you're a startup today and payments is not part of your business plan, you're missing out. If you're um, not achieving the valuation, you're not uh, achieving the, the traction that you should. So I'm going to run through a, a wide range of examples here. I'll try to uh, be geographically, um, let's say, equal. Um, I must admit that I've worked on every continent and built broker dealers and other infrastructure on every continent but Africa. So that's a bit of a blind spot for me. And I saw, saw a few people joining from that continent, so I apologize. It's not something I can talk knowledgeably about. Um, the, the other thing that you have around these four vectors, let's say you, you obviously have an underlying infrastructure that's a national payment system. So in the next section, I will talk a bit about the role of governments and such infrastructure and payments with two examples. And uh, you have open banking on top of all of these that depending on the regulation and the jurisdiction you're in has different shapes and forms. Um, so let's start with the startups. That seems to make lots of sense. So the, the challenge obviously is that we're moving tremendously fast. So it doesn't take much. You can take a basic Amazon Web Services subscription and you can spin up your startup at $50, right? Or the equivalent of whatever your currency is. And you, you can scale it quite successfully, or you can scale it quickly if you're successful and attract more users. So long gone are the days where we had P2P payments, right? That is a bit like PayPal in 2002 or so. And, Elon Musk and Peter Thiel can tell us that story. Um, then the next feature was this uh, bill split payment thing. So when you go with the friends to your restaurant, and that's table stakes today. I personally have never used it, though. I, I don't know, um, but seems to be very popular, right? And then the, the third generation is a, a personal financial manager. Right. So if you don't have a PFM these days, you really don't have a seat at the table either. And this graphic specifically comes from Tink, which again, it's a Nordic startup and, and payments company. They actually give you a software development kit, an SDK, and a, a skilled software engineer can stitch together right, a basic PFM in about 30 minutes. I'm not hands on in, in my programming skills anymore. Probably takes me four hours, but the barriers to entry for this market are non existent, right? So here you get it in, in half an hour for a PFM. Great stuff. Um, next one also becomes table stakes, uh, multi currency account. So here it's TransferWise, which obviously is one of the um, Unicorns, the elephants in the room when it comes to international transfers as well. You can have an account that has whatever, 30 different currencies in there. You can get the same from Revolut. You can get the same from Sync. And it's actually not very difficult to build. It takes a bit longer than the 30 minutes uh, of the PFM. But many of these companies as the underlying infrastructure or the service provider use currency cloud, which is a specialist for these. And so if you build your functionality on currency cloud, again, you don't really have to do much yourself. You are just APIing in. So 
Stripe um, is the best payment company for startups. And um, with the last um, fundraising round, I think they reached 36 billion US dollars. Um, they actually aiming for about 100 without doing an IPO. And they are covering every single aspect of payments these days. And they're moving so fast. Oh, this is my this is my Africa slide. So we do have representation, right? So uh, they have Stripe had a, a kind of blind spot in Africa as well. So they spent about two hundred million dollars on acquiring Paystack, which is uh, I think in, based in Nigeria originally and expanding now also with Stripe's backing across the African continent. So very exciting to see that. Um, I think in terms of payments in Africa. As you can see many of the blockchain protocols, cryptocurrency, trying to take a step at um, banking the unbanked. But here's uh, really something that enables startups to offer payment services. And so, if you if you look at the Stripe uh, customer list, everybody is on Stripe, and the. Uh, mind-boggling thing is the one here right on top, which is Shopify, which has an insane valuation because obviously we're all uh, sh doing e-commerce shopping while we are locked down. And if you if you just take a simple look at the valuation, the stock price of Shopify, and the percentage of the payments related revenue, right? You see a clear correlation uh, there. I uh, think yesterday they closed over 1,200, somewhere near 1,300. And uh, you think they are an e commerce website uh, with 80% of the revenue coming from payments. Are they actually a payments company, right? And so, uh, similar to Robin Hood, the product might not be. Uh, what you think it is, right? The e-commerce transaction is just a trigger to actually get to the payment. And now, if you if you are a startup, right, you can work with um, Stripe and you, you can get revenue. But if you, let's say, a vertical startup, for example, you uh, have software for gyms, well, maybe not the best example during the pandemic, but you have software for gyms and you're deployed in 5,000 gyms across France or Costa Rica or whatever it might be, um, then from a starting point of around 50 million US dollar in revenue, it would actually make sense for you to insource your payments. And you can do this. There's companies like Phoenix that allow you basically to avoid building a technology team around payments and use their pre-built functionality. But to take this in and avoid the charges that a Stripe or a Square uh, would would um, incur. And so, um, as I said, 50 million. So you need to be uh, somewhat skilled already. And then, right, a little bit of promotion here. We do have a podcast. Um, Rails Bank is being built by one of the founders of Currency Cloud that I mentioned. And they describe themselves as building an invisibility cloak for finance. You can find this on our podcast, which has been renamed, and you get, get another recommendation later on. But uh, again, these are platforms that basically lend you um, their functionality. So let's talk a bit about the the old stodgy banks, and I can probably talk a bit more knowledgeably uh, around the economics in Asia. We have, depending on the market, you look at about forty to seventy percent of the bank's revenue actually comes from payments transactions. And so when you look at the title, we're talking about retail payments, right? So there's a it's an interesting um, separation going on between retail and, and corporate payments simply because the retail payments will be free. And everything we talk about platforming on the retail side actually has happened 
to a certain extent already on the corporate merchant banking side where you have a treasury systems treasury support for organizations and you're basically tied into the platform with additional services right whether it's uh, lending facilities working capital etc so uh, it's not that between 40 and 70 percent of your revenue are at risk but a portion of that certainly uh, comes at risk when you go to zero um, one point i wanted to highlight in terms of the the new banks between the European and the uh, Middle and South American approach. So N26 is the, the prominent German neo bank with millions of customers. Klar is a Mexican bank that good friends at Maro Capital, which used to be Santander Innoventures, invested in. And what you typically get, and you get it with Starling, um, uh, Monzo, et cetera, also in, in the UK, you get it certainly with N26 in Germany. They are, they're pretty much payments driven. So they give you a current account. Um, they give you right the, the ability to make payments uh, because it's all free and, and fintechs somehow have gotten the idea that they give their services away for free. Uh, many people use it as a secondary account, not as a primary account. And in Latin America, the approach is much more loan-driven, lending-driven, and, and that's the investment thesis for, um, for Mauro in, into Clark. So they specifically pointed that out as a differentiator in terms of how the, the, the markets work. You obviously, not, not all banks are bad. Um, I think when, when you look at the these, these structure that we have, it's the payment infrastructure on the bottom and open banking on the top, you might uh, have to fear that banks become dumb pipes, and many of them certainly will, but there's some very good examples of banks that either have always been digital, like Tinkoff in Russia, and Sergey probably can talk much more about that than I can, but it's a... It's a fantastic bank that is also building organically an, an ecosystem while the competitor in Russia is doing acquisitions. We've got Moneta in the Czech Republic, which I think is much more of a transformation story, and AK Bank in Turkey, for example. So these are examples when you look at uh, digital banking, acumen, including payments. These are banks that you would be looking at. And then we've got the discussion around fintech, tech fin, right? Big tech going into the, the financial markets. And you've got the tie up of Google with Citi in the US. So you get Google accounts that are backed by Citi, which I think is an amazing story because Citi obviously is a very old and, and stodgy bank, but they can work together at an accelerated pace. So they certainly have done something right. And they started that transformation, um, I, I would say, probably eight or 10 years ago. So the end result of that is that they can have these alliances. And then you have Goldman Sachs and MasterCard, which is a slightly different story because Goldman Sachs uh, didn't have a retail business before we actually created the Goldman Sachs Bank USA uh, when we became a Fed regulated bank in the global financial crisis over a weekend together with Morgan Stanley. And uh, now 10 years later, 12 years later, it's being used for the consumer offering. So there's a whole greenfield consumer business being built and together with Apple here partnering on the, on the card. So which leads us to open banking. And uh, I always drive my friends nuts and you probably think I'm going crazy now but um, I I do ask my insurance friends what are you doing about open banking and the, the reason simply is that it's an asymmetrical playing field so PSD2 as a regulation in Europe uh, consumer data rights CDR in Australia and you have it in many other markets forces the banks to open their pipes and typically there are two trend two different licenses one is uh, that you get access to account information 
Um, so it's an AISP account information service provider, and then you've got payment initiation. So you've got an PISP payment initiation service provider. And um, basically, you, you obviously become regulated, you need to get a, a license and an approval. Um, but ultimately, you can get access to the banking transaction data. And if I was an insurance company and I have access to all the insurance data, on my customers and I can get free access to additional financial information that gives me a full picture, I would go after that. But um, everybody thinks I'm nuts, but I, I do think that oh, this is one of the things that over the next two years, you're actually going to see that. And uh, part of that will be market driven, part of that will be regulatory driven um, because the CDO in Australia is while it starts with uh, the the payments and the banks, it, it is actually across industry. So we'll include insurance and um, uh, utilities and telecom providers, et cetera. And the other movement that's very interesting at the end of last year in South Korea, the, the regulators started to look at the fairness of this open data regulation and they've been publicly contemplating, right, in return for getting access to open banking data, that the e-commerce companies would need to open up their order information, right? So that would be the equivalent of you getting and you granting an app the right to read your Amazon order history. So I think that's an interesting trend we're going to see. Um, Open banking data is free these days. And so it's again like payments. If you're in the payment business and that is just somebody else's customer acquisition cost, right, that represents a challenge. But if you're in the open banking business and you're providing open banking access and for somebody else, <laughs> that's the customer ac acquisition cost. It's a similar interesting conundrum. And Nordigan, which is in, based in the Baltics, uh, they make their money by classifying transaction information, right? So they, they identify whether it's uh, for, for food, for car, et cetera. And uh, they actually opened their, they, they use an open banking to provide free access uh, to this account information, right? It's always permissioned by the user, of course, but you, you don't have to build the infrastructure. You can use the infrastructure and obviously they're trying then to sell the categorization services on the back of that. Um, very interesting example. Um, I would love to talk much more about Bahrain where we spent this almost now, it's 18 months ago probably. Bahrain implemented open banking regulation within a 12 month period, which is absolutely mind boggling. And uh, Abdullah al Murayat, who's a gentleman, uh, second person on the right, uh, founder of Tarabut Gateway, has been a driving force behind that. Um, it was like six months of considerations and review of the regulation. And then basically the regulator said, you banks need to be ready in six months time. And so if you have, the will to change and to open up, um, you can accomplish quite a lot. And so it's a good example of what the regulator or the government can actually uh, accomplish or how, how they can be a catalyst for that tremendous pace. And uh, I think set an example for the whole region and the uh, Middle East, Northern African market is huge and it's a hugely young population that is underserved. So I think it's a very exciting market to look at. Um, I just keep talking, Martin. Um, so I'm winding hopefully up very quickly. Um, one point is on the, the rule of government. Uh, I want to give you two examples. One is known as the India stack. So India since 2009, and uh, with the ATAR ID system has built out a stack that now is leading to a true can be an explosion in the FinTech and the payment space. So you have what is called the UPI, Unified Payment Interface, 
um, which used to be charged for uh, as they were building the infrastructure. And it, it started in was it, around 2015, 16, I would say. Uh, it became free um, at some point over the last 12, 18 months. And uh, the, the interesting part around it is from a positioning perspective, um, again, small promotion here for podcast, which we actually released only two, two days ago. Um, talking about the, the overall Indian payments landscape is that because there's such a great connectivity of the bank accounts now, it, is that people don't use mobile wallets anymore. So me here, here from PwC is an expert and uh, you might enjoy this conversation. Uh, it's now the Tokyo FinTech podcast is now the Exponential Finance podcast. This is brand new. I put it out on Tuesday. Uh, the second example of the government is Cambodia, uh, where we have Project Bakon, which is a central bank digital currency. Um, it is based on Suramitsu, which is a Japanese company which contributed their blockchain technology, Iroha, to Hyperledger. And so this is the, the only time where I give you a blockchain example. And it's a, it's a fascinating story for a number of reasons, simply because Cambodia for the longest time had the US dollar as a black market parallel currency. Um, they had to really spend about 10 years to stabilize this and make the national currency the primary currency. So when they went digital now, they wanted to use this to enhance the standing of the national currency and not get end up in a parallel world again. Um, in Cambodia, you have a mobile phone penetration of around 150%, right? so meaning uh, two people have three phones. Um, but only 30% of the people had bank accounts. And so now, similar maybe to the India approach in certain extent, and what happened in China as well, is that when you uh, go into the mobile app and you, you uh, register yourself, you automatically get registered with a bank account. So uh, I think a very clever way of banking the unbanked and a, a fascinating project if you want to Google that quickly. A um, um, few things I maybe I should break here, Martin. We, there, there's some trends uh, we can we can further talk about, but given the the time, I've got three more slides. I think we can open it to question if you have any. It's not there are any yet questions. I have quite a lot of questions for you, but at the moment uh, I would say just talk on uh, if you want to. Um, otherwise, I can. Well, where is my view? I have to my camera uh, give me one second where am i here now i'm visible <laughs> sorry for that um yeah I, I actually i have some questions but i'm quite sure there will be coming some from the from the audience as well um at the beginning let's let's start with the beginning um the this this very first shot nearly uh, was free and and zero i think it was so no cost anymore um, and you said there, uh, you asked the, the, of course, interesting question, so how to make money if everything is free? And you gave three answers if I got it right. You said, well, one idea would be to do cross-selling to other products, which won't be free. The other one was a little bit like, let's say, upselling this metal credit card, so giving something extra. And the third one was subscription. Um, subscriptions or recipients are paying the fees. So there are some fees at the end. Um, I was thinking about uh, not only payments, but for example, um, the, the the money, uh, no, the, the the orders for stocks, and you had the the, the examples there. From my experience in the past, um, the banks try to to get a fee for consulting, for advice for the from the clients, but they never really got a business model out of that. So the clients, well, they were still paying for for the transaction, but didn't like to pay for advice or for consulting. How do you see that as a fourth pillar? So didn't you mention it because you don't think this will ever work? Or is there a market in, in advice or in consulting and additional things there? 
Well, I mean, I think the, the reality is that there are two groups who have private bankers these days, and it's at the top 0.1% and probably something like the bottom 30% or so, right? Where um, you actually, you don't have a banking relationship and you need to go to the money broker in your village and you need to borrow at extreme rates, etc. And so I, I think what many of the entrepreneurs, the, the social entrepreneurs, the UN and, and other organizations objective is, and I heard it in Saggy's comments at the beginning as well, is these uh, bank the unbanked. And I actually think, right, we don't want to bank them because for the most part, banks are maybe not necessarily the best solution. Let's at least fintech them uh, or maybe right empower them to make their own decisions uh, because simply as, as successful as UPI is in India, it's still... 500, 600 million uh, registered there. It still leaves a large part of the population uncovered, yet although they have a magnificent uh, infrastructure that also mm -hmm. allows you to uh, take, like, some, for example, pandemic benefits uh, and get them directly into your ATAR account and then go to a point of sale in your village and actually get the money. So you don't need a mm -hmm. bank. You don't even right need to need need any other infrastructure. And that's that's ultimately also where I'm saying that uh, we, we we will have an ATMless future because um, the ATM is just the reverse of the payment process, right? So if I can mm -hmm. go with my app and the QR code into a shop to pay, why? couldn't the shop function as uh, in C2 ATM and give me money, which like in the US, for example, if you pay with a credit card and you, you want some cash, they add $20 to your bill and you get $20 in cash. It's not no, no different. You don't need an ATM anymore. I think that's one of the interesting points if you're looking how digital transformation is changing our world. Um, that you really might go into a world without cash, which for me being 50, nearly 50 now is a little bit of, of astonishing world. Um, actually, I don't use cash much uh, anymore. So I, I, for the last 10 months, I think I spent about 200 euro in cash and all the rest I spent was, was online or was spent with credit cards. So I saw some figures for several markets over the last 10, 12 months, how, how the cash was diminishing and we are getting into this cashless world. From a government's point of view, and you brought that as well into the discussion, uh, I think there's one, one section is that the governments might be very interested to get a cashless world because the black markets uh, are going away if you have a cashless world because everything you're doing will be in some way documented and will be much harder to evade taxes. So um, I, I think that was one of the reasons why Sweden did this as well. Um, so would you see that there is a, there are downsides to this cashless world besides maybe of not being able to get uh, evading your taxes? Is, are there other downsides? <laughs> is, it, is it a downside that you can't evade taxes? I mean, it's well, clearly... It depends on the view. Sorry for that. <laughs> speaking from the Japanese perspective, Right, the drive to cashless certainly uh, first was driven a bit by trying to look a bit more advanced when the Olympics come around, whenever that might be now. But certainly also looking at the the revenue generation for the government, uh, right? All these small shops, I, I we don't have to even take a bet. I mean, then they're not declaring all their income simply because they couldn't survive otherwise. Um, I think China, right, is is a very interesting example. Obviously, very advanced in terms of their digital currency, which is not necessarily blockchain based. But um, I think my, I've got to we have we need to be careful. We might might come across as cynical, but um, any any country that hits their GDP targets almost to the point every year. Uh, smells a bit fishy to me, and it, it's like you're you're kind of 
working backwards for the number and then you you kind of make it and i i, I honestly b believe that the chinese government doesn't really have a good grips on the econ economic activity that's really going on because it's a big country and the in incentives uh, for making your numbers it's a bit like the old uh, GE General Electric and uh, uh, Jack Welch, right? The pressure is so high to make your numbers, everybody's making their numbers, even if they have to make up the numbers, that when you actually have a cashless society and you've got the centralized currency, you've got a real-time view into the economic activity. And I, I think that's a big driver for China. And, and the, the, the last one there is obviously... Um, a, a global politics play of uh, weakening the position of the the US dollar but then we get into right a whole whole different topic that we can spend yeah. the next three hours on um, I, I think historically it's very clear that you've never had a, a world currency a global globally dominant currency from a country that right wasn't open. Mm -hmm. And uh, the payment flows and, and many other things in China are not open. So it would be surprising to see that happen. But right, uh, if we knew the future, we probably wouldn't be here. Yeah, that's one of the things we would like to see in the future. Um, um, there's a first question from Samuel. Um, he said, uh, when do you see banks accepting Bitcoins or as a legitimate uh, form of payment? I think there are already some banks doing this somewhere all over the world. I saw it at least in Germany that you could buy bitcoins directly at your bank. I don't know whether it works the other way around. Um, I think N N N26 was one of them, if I got it right. But do you see other examples all over the world? Yeah, I, th I think it's a bit of a of, of smoke and mirrors game, quite honestly. So. Uh, J Japan was the first country to come out with a regulation around cryptocurrencies in April 2017, uh, simply because we have some history here with Mt. Gox. And um, actually, the regulator also tried to change and be more uh, business promoting. And so I could go to an electronic shop in 2017 and pay with Bitcoin. And, but just like the same as right paying with your US dollar credit card in Japan, somebody in the middle does the, the instant transaction and, and translation and the, the merchant gets Japanese yen. So you need to be careful of what it actually is when people saying that. Uh, I think the, the payments play on Bitcoin is over. It's not going to be a payment instrument, right? So if again, if you if you look at money, you've got three functions. You've got a form of payment, you've got a store of value, and you've got a unit of account. And so I'm not being very adventurous if I say it's not going to be the goal global currency. It's right. It, it, it's going to be something else and it's probably going to be some shape and form of maybe a central bank digital currency. Is it a store of value? Yeah, I think you can view it as digital gold and many people see it that way. And uh, we can have a discussion whether store of value, what volatility you'd be willing to accept. Um, but uh, that's one thing. Uh, will it ever become a unit of account? I doubt it as well, right? And there's there's so much innovation going on in this overall space. Um, we're, we're still in the early, very early stages. Who knows what's going to come in three or four years. Right? Mm -hmm. There are two questions coming now on uh, both in the same direction. So how do you see the, the role of, of the postal companies? So if there is a, um, at the moment, a lot of company, postal companies, operators worldwide, accepting cash and, and sending them around as a, as a transfer service. Um, uh, if we get go into a cashless world, it seems that that cut of business will be at least smaller maybe in the future. So how do you see the role of the post office, especially probably in the, in the less developed countries where they, they have some kind of 
of local um, acceptance and a very good trust status for as well. So what do you think about that? If I find it a super interesting question because I, the, the, the different um, vectors on that, I think. So uh, I think it depends on how whatever tech savvy one is or uh, adventure is versus using the, the standard rails. I think there's a, there's a large part of the expatriate community, right? The domestic helpers uh, that you have in Singapore and Hong Kong, and uh, you've got a more limited amount here in Japan. Um, you've got quite a few in the Middle East who are sending money back to Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, etc. right? Um, I, I think the more tech savvy part of these have used digital currencies, cryptocurrencies to transfer money because the fees are ridiculously low compared to a Western Union or MoneyGram. Um, and uh, I, I personally, right, um, there's, there's nothing. And, and now you've got, right, you've got the Financial Action Task Force, FATF, breathing down on the crypto exchanges. So um, actually, there's no money laundering going on, right? If you want to hide hide your trail of uh, illicit gains, you don't use a cryptocurrency because you get in digital exhaust and people yeah. have gotten very, very good at tracing that. Um, so you, you wouldn't right, buy a gun with Bitcoin. That would be plain stupid, but some people maybe still do that. Um, the, uh, there was one other point, but also I, I, I would say that Right, I'm. I've I've been a great fan from like 25 years ago, almost of the the post office. So I used two things when I first left Germany. Uh, generally, for inter-European transfers, I used uh, Fidelity because they had currency funds, and so you could buy, let's say, a, a Deutsche Mark fund with British pounds, um, with a British pound check, and then sell them and have a transfer to your German account. And if you were not time sensitive, they had the best rates um, because they were just charging you um, basically buying and selling a very low margin. And from Japan, I, I did use postal transfers because they were the cheapest uh, at the time. And the, the regulations were such that it wasn't like you, you had to fill in all your life's history and to prove the origin of the funds in, in the early 2000s. So I love the system. It's like 20 bucks to send whatever, $2,000, I would say. So 1%, not bad. Um, uh, in, a, in a cashless world, look, I mean, there, there are many different ways of sending money. I had to uh, transfer a bulk recently from the US to Japan. I use TransferWise. Um, quite honestly, it was the least painful. Uh, it, it was the, the fastest. Clearly, right, when you send small amounts, they're not transferring your money. But if you send, let's say, $100 from your TransferWise account in one country to another country, assuming that they have a, a real time payment. Uh, system, you, you basically hit the button and uh, it, it will withdraw the money from your account on the one side and, I don't know, less than a minute later, you see it on the other side. Right? With larger amounts, they don't do that and they really use still SWIFT. Um, but there's also, on, if you talk about SWIFT, they have this GPI initiative and they get getting into the retail side. So uh, it's a crowded field, right? Everybody's doing payments. Um, thanks for that. So if I got it right, you would say that especially in the, in the transfer of money um, from people working abroad, for example, is a big market where you said, okay, with the trust uh, of a postal company, you can really be in that market, having the local trust. I think there's another question from Stefan regarding the, what would you be advice for the post in Africa? I would expand this to the well, some of the less developed countries uh, with regards to the role in achieving the, the cashless policies. So again, it would be probably being not only in the cash part of this uh, of the game as well, but in the cashless part game of the well, uh, game part of the game as well. 
proposed to companies. Um, or how do you see that? Well, I mean, I, I think um, coming coming back to the the subtitle of the presentation, I I think um, again, and this is something that we've been talking about for two plus years, and uh, it's another nice theme that got accelerated, unfortunately, by the pandemic uh, when we we say we have a branchless and ATMless future. Right, you. I think in Europe you've seen a clear decline in in bank branches over the last ten years. Absolutely. It's very measurable. Um, Japan is completely overbanked. Uh, Singapore is horribly overbanked, but I mean it's a it's a tiny little place, so there there really is a bank or an ATM at every every corner, um, and yeah. Uh, in in a way, right? Depending on the structure of the um, postal office and whether there's a post bank or um, separated, like in in some countries, or it's still under one one roof and others. Uh, by law, in most countries, you must provide the postal service in rural areas right at mm -hmm. the same price you do it anywhere else so which is obviously a loss leader where uh, for me i feel in an environment where everybody is withdrawing from a physical presence and you have no choice but you need to continue providing that physical presence that's actually a clear differentiator and mm -hmm. you need to see how you play that out right i think um the, the 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 combination of online offline uh, can provide a, a true proposition, mm -hmm. and I think what that means in your specific context in your specific country might largely depend on the custom and habits, and so it becomes an innovation question, right? It becomes it becomes a question of try out and see what sticks and iterate around them. But I, but I, even if it's depending probably on country, as you're saying, but I, I like the basic idea of saying the 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 rural, not only the rural address, but the the possibility to be everywhere and uh, might not be only a, a hardship, which is probably is sometimes, but it might be as well a chance, which you can use, especially for other services than only being the postal services. And you can use the trust people have in you because if they give you a letter, they know that this letter will be transported to somewhere else. Yeah. They trust in you and you can, well, use that trust and spill it over to other things like banking and use it there. So that makes, yeah, makes absolutely I, sense. I didn't want to make the, the first part too depressing, right? But I think uh, the decline in letter volume, you will see, and it's hard to put a time frame on that, let's say over the next 15 years, you will see a decline in parcel volume, which kind of kept the postal office afloat while the letter volume declined. As simply, we will because we will be much more sustainable and we will be three D printing locally, right? So I'm not mm -hmm. going to. I might still go to Amazon and and order a blueprint for three D printing for a certain part, but that wouldn't be shipped anymore. And so I'm thinking that my copy shop, my print shop will become a 3D printing store where you take that blueprint and upload it. But um, you could do the same with the post office, right? Yeah, which is interesting again. Nova, thanks a lot. I, I know there are a lot of other questions. I, I would have probably questions. Like you said, you have slides for another three hours. I would probably have questions for another three hours. But we are, but we are already a little bit of overtime. So, um, thanks a lot to you, first of all, for being here in the middle of the night, being quite awake and gave us a great presentation. So thank you, Norbert, for that presentation and answering all the questions. Thanks to you. I will do a clapping now. Oh, well, you, you hear now, at least now, you're still here, 100 people clapping. Oh, wow. It's like that. <laughs> thanks Sorry all for, for taking that. the time. Appreciate it. Uh, I know you could have done something else and work on new products for your clients. And so taking one hour of your day, appreciate that. Thank you.
And uh, I would like to um, invite everybody. So if you thought that the podca podcast of, of Norbert might be interesting for you, and I know some of them, so I know they might be interesting for you, I would really recommend that. And we might send around a link to them as well. So thanks, Norbert. And as well, thank you, Alexandra and Sergey and Abby from the UPU um, for making all of this possible. And the last thanks is going to everybody here attending. Uh, Norbert already said it. Thanks for taking the time attending the session. And I hope to see you again. We will do another session in some weeks. And um, we will just deciding on the, the topics. I just see Norbert a lot of greats and thanks. And thanks for the presentation. I need so, to put on my office to see that. Thank <laughs> you. Beside of uh, me saying thanks to everybody, it's thanks to everybody. So have a good day, have a good working day for the ones who are in the morning, having a good evening, having a good night for the ones who are late. And I hope to see you all back soon. Thanks a lot and goodbye. Good night.